Hello, everyone. Um, so yeah, welcome. This is my talk, The Power of the Jam, uh, finding new ways of testing and validating design. I hope you find it useful. Um, generally speaking, when I give presentations, I almost see it as like a conversation more than like a lecture. So if you have any questions, any points, anything you want to raise, well, as far as I'm concerned, feel free to raise your hand. Um, and yeah, let's, um, let's do this. So yeah, my name is Florence. Um, I do use experience and service design, and I'm one of those people who likes to think a lot. And I have to be honest, when I was first um, invited here, I was, of course, incredibly flattered. Like, this was literally my face when um, I got the email. I mean, it's, and it's totally awesome, right? Because when you get asked to do these kind of talks, it's really kind of like a massive coming out party in a way. You're, you're out there to the tech community going like, here I am, this is me, this is my truth. Um, and of course, you know, you get to test out jokes, you get to see which ones land, and then you can kind of carefully, strategically figure out how many future talks you can use them in um, before they no longer become funny. And of course, of course, um, getting the five like point on a YouTube video, I mean, that's really what it's all about, right, you know? <laughs> no, okay, cool. So, but most importantly, I really love talking about user experience. I'm kind of obsessed with user experience. Um, in fact, I was just saying to someone, actually of all the things that I've tried to do, um, for some reason user experience is a thing that um, I've stuck with the longest. And partly I think it appeals to you know, someone like me um, who likes to think a lot about technology and, and humans and how, and how humans interact with technology. And certainly um, as a designer um, and a technologist, I, I think in many ways what we are really is, you know, we're, we're creating cyborgs. If you think about what a cybernetic organism is, it's basically a human that's interfacing with technology to achieve whatever goals they need to. So essentially, I am a mother of cyborgs. Take that, Daenerys Stormborn Targaryen. <laughs> So yeah, this is one of the things that I find really fascinating about, about user experience. It's why I love to talk about it. It's why I love to think about it. Probably think about it a bit too much. Um, yeah, I totally see myself um, mother cyborgs, as I said. Um, of course, it's really just an excuse to use a ghost, ghost in the shell gif, because <laughs> why not? <laughs> so yeah, someone who likes to think about stuff. I'm a theorist, but I'm kind of a theorist with a bit of an existential crisis, because to be honest, I actually really hate being a theorist. Um, this is probably due to some, I don't know, weird trauma that I probably experienced at school. But, you know, the fact of the matter is that I know by nature I like to sit down and I like to think about stuff. And I like to keep on thinking and probably overthinking about stuff. But what I've always wanted to be really is a doer, someone who makes things, someone who's out there and cool and can change the world and isn't always kind of sitting in the corner thinking, oh yeah, but if we try this use case, and have you thought about, oh my God, and how does that intersect with that? And oh my goodness, blah, 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 no. I want to be out there making stuff. And that ultimately is kind of what brought me um, to the jam. So we'll start off um, by clarifying what I actually am talking about when I talk about a jam. So I'm not, of course, as you probably realize, because you're all fairly smart people, I'm not, of course, talking about literal strawberry jam. Although, I wish, because, yeah. To be honest, I'm more of a goosenog kind of person. But yeah, OK, if you like strawberry jam, fine, whatever. Uh, taste can't be helped. No, what I'm talking about um, are design jams. Um, so <clears throat> my journey into this was really as um, kind of a, a naive and sweet young uh, junior user experience designer looking um, for new things to be involved with, new hackathons and stuff. And I, came across this event that was going on in Birmingham called the Global Sustainability Jam. Um, <clears throat> and when I looked up on the website, what I found really fascinating was that this really was sort of a hackathon that was geared around designing and for designers. Um, the guys who um, started up the Global Jam phenomenon describe it, use the metaphor of, like a, of a music um, a jam session where you're coming together, you're bringing your skills, you're bringing your interests, you're bringing your stress from the day, you're bringing your loves, your hopes, your dreams. Um, someone comes up with, I don't know, a couple of notes, a really interesting chord, and you riff on that, and you keep on going on that, and you keep on moving forward. You let the music take you where, where it goes. Um, and that's exactly what uh, the design jam is. Except for without, it's not necessarily with music, although it could be, um, but it's about jamming with ideas. And for someone who really, was passionate about becoming more of a doer and less of a thinker, this seemed like a brilliant thing to get involved with. <clears throat> 
One of the things I really found extremely exciting about the jam process as well was that it kind of distilled all the things that I'd read about, sort of like in Smashing UX magazine and all the stuff that Jared Spool speaks about, and all the, all the great leaders and thinkers in the world of UX and service design, um, who in many ways, obviously, you know, you look up to, they're complete, and complete geniuses, but in some ways, their experiences really didn't quite tally with mine, and uh, I'll, I'll go a bit more into that um, later on. But one of the things I've, I found really, re uh, really refreshing actually about the jam process was just kind of how obviously it's kind of slightly messy it was. The idea is that it's fairly simple. You know, you start off with a theme, you start off with an inspiration, um, you get together with other people, you start discussing, you start jamming, you start riffing, and then you start testing, you start building, you start prototyping. Um, and then you have a check to make sure that you're all okay, that you know, nobody's feeling like they want to leave or quit. Um, and then you get right back to it. <clears throat> and at the very end, you get to celebrate. Um, and every now and again, you know, someone throws a curveball and you get to do a silly dance. Um, that's also quite cool. So how can uh, the design jam principle actually be of benefit? So I think at this point, I'll probably give a bit more context about um, where I was coming from when I first encountered the jam, as it were. <clears throat> so I was a junior user experience consultant um, working at a large utilities firm. Um, and I noticed that every day um, within every project, and it really was actually every day, although perhaps the challenges each day might um, vary um, in scale, but there are certain challenges that you know, you'd always face um, and that I, I often felt were quite unique to being sort of the in-house UX designer. Um, often I, I kind of looked in envy at my friends who work in consultancies because in some sense they kind of had it lucky. They had kind of had it easy really. You know, the people that they were working for knew what was expected of them when they, were, when they had asked to have like a UX team come, come on board and help them out with what, whatever it was that they needed to do. And whilst there were always challenges, the challenges that, that I encountered as an in-house UX designer weren't really the challenges that were often spoken about um, on all the cool podcasts and service design um, lectures that I'd, I'd check out. So obviously, firstly, processes. Processes, <laughs> oh, processes, I literally, like just the word just makes me shudder. Um, so something about the processes that you would encounter, um, you come from this background where you'd be trying to implement sort of design thinking techniques. Um, you'd be trying to get on, you know, low on the ground with the users, walk around with them, walk with them, talk with them, eat with them, sleep with, well, maybe not sleep with them, but you know what I mean. Like, you're really trying to get to know these people. Um, and there was always, and actually for fairly good reason, some, some process that might just have hinted that. Um, but because of the fact that you know, you're working sort of within um, a large um, IT structure, you know, it wasn't quite geared up or ready for the kind of techniques um, that I'd often heard being um, told us, you know, this is the way you should be doing UX. <coughs> Funding. Yeah, again, it's another practical issue. And this, again, was something that <laughs> Jared Spall never spoke about, the difficulties of funding. You know, he never spoke about the fact that, actually, if you wanted to implement any change, it had to be sanctioned, it had to be written off by BAs and SAs and all these other people within the business. Um, and if, there were, if it wasn't in the budget, if at the beginning of, of the financial year they hadn't, they hadn't thought that we need to, say, retool or we need to do some ethnography, and indeed, why would you think about doing ethnography if you're a massive utility company? Well, then you just didn't really get to do your work, quite frankly. On the other hand, for those who were consultants coming in, work on particular, say, app development projects or, or web development projects, well, that was, that was a, there was already a pot of money, there was something in place for them to, to use, okay? So in a sense, for all the difficulties that obviously we all experience as user experience designers, I c again, I couldn't help but look on with a slight feeling of envy. I just thought, you guys, oh my God, you have it so good. <laughs> you don't have to encounter this really, Oh, rather frustrating issue. And it was particularly frustrating, again, because it kind of loops into the issue about processes. Because who actually controls the finances? Well, it often isn't anyone who anyone actually speaks to within, say, the IT team, you know? So, yeah, funding. That's an issue that nobody ever talks about on Smashing UX. Politics! Oh, right. So this lady, she was born for politics. I was not. 
To be honest, I mean, I say I'm a theorist. I actually really don't like corporate psychology. I think a lot of it's nonsense. I mean, but then, you know, I'm also Scorpio, so maybe that's why. Um, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, I suspect there is some truth in the sense that, yeah, maybe as a theorist, maybe as someone who likes to kind of sit down and, and think a lot about her problem, but the problems that she's encountering first, this world of, you know, of, polit of, of the corporate politic was something that, again, when you're permanently inside a particular, within a company, um, is a challenge that isn't, again, often really discussed. If you're coming in as an external consultant, yeah, fine, you might have difficult people to work with, in the, with within the clients, but again, you do the product, you do the project, it's done, it's over, you're out, you know, you get paid. If you're in-house, well, <laughs> you're always there, you will always meet these people, and if you failed them once, or if they think you're pretentious ass, then that's pretty much that, to be honest, and that can really impede um, future projects, especially considering all the other um, challenges that you face in light of funding and processes. You know, the politics really does um, become paramount. And again, if you're a little geek who likes to dream up of mothering cyborgs, yeah, that can be kind of difficult. Fatigue. Initially, I was going to put skepticism, but actually, I quite like skepticism. Um, and actually, I think that's kind of unfair as well. I think a lot of the time, one, a lot of the things that I encountered in working quite a large organisation was actually fatigue. And you know what? Working there for a couple of months, I could totally understand why. Because for all that I had come in as a young, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, user-experience consultant with all these lovely ideas, Whenever I, I spoke to someone who'd maybe worked within IT in general, maybe not even in that particular company, but say just within that field for, what, maybe two, three years even, that's all it took. You could kind of see their eyes almost go like, okay, so here we go, this is the latest fad, and that's gonna last about two minutes, and okay, cool, right, so I don't really have to pay any attention to this. Um, and if I do, it's only to be like, okay, that's nice, dear. Do you wanna, I don't know, go back to making coffee or something, because you're quite good at that. But yeah, fatigue. The fact of the matter is that certainly within IT, I mean, we, we were just having this conversation early today about um, the, like the way that languages, for example, change, the way that Java, the number of JavaScript frameworks that seem to appear sort of exponentially like every month. And although it's not quite to the same extent within sort of IT, when you think about methodologies and processes, the fact is that things, there always seems to be some new innovation. And Again, this probably speaks a lot about why service design and process design and system thinking is actually really important and grossly underlooked. The fact of the matter is that a lot of these changes tend to get pushed down from the top. So if you're someone who's working essentially at the bottom, such as myself, um, or another business analyst or another, um, or another solutions architect, yeah, ultimately, fine, you go along with these principles, you go along with these, this cool stuff that you've read about in like the latest IBM white paper, but, uh, it gets kind of tiring. Um, again, when you have this like young, eager, high-pitched, high-pitched high voice girl who keeps talking about cyborgs and transhumanism, you can totally understand why they'd be like, "Okay, here we go again. Design thinking. This is this is the latest thing. Great, we have to deal with." So yeah, <laughs> me. That's often how it very much felt as a sort of a, a junior user experience consultant. Because on the one hand, you'd hear all these amazing techniques, all these really cool ways of designing and, and getting things done. Um, and then kind of you go, we'd walk into the office like, look, I'm here. There's this thing we could do. And of course, well, people barely got their heads around agile, for goodness sake. So what are they going to make of like design thinking? Ugh. Yeah, it was, it was a, a lot of frustration. And again, because I really don't want to make the sound as though the issue is simply the system, because after all, as an employee, I'm part of that system. You know, it's as much an issue with myself as well. So if you go in often with perhaps, um, say, a bit of a saviour's complex, you know? Um, and so maybe some of these problems were kind of inevitable. And maybe if I'd perhaps thought about it a bit more, I wouldn't have felt so frustrated. But anyway, I don't know. Um, I have to be honest, I really like this GIF. Sorry, Kiki's Delivery Service is one of my favourite anime films of all time. Um, and when I found this, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> How, how funny that like the perfect gift to, to describe my early career as a user experience consultant would come from one of my favorite movies. It's beautiful, I love it. <laughs> but I digress. Okay, so back to the jam, the jam principle. 
So here I am, I've just been ranting and, and railing about the difficulties of being an in-house user experience consult designer. <coughs> And I've been also, but I've also just been saying that, yeah, well, the jam process can kind of help with that. Now, disclaimer first, I don't want to make it sound like this is like the answer. Um, again, I'm someone who's a theorist, but I like to think of myself as maybe a slightly more practical theorist. I, I don't think that, say, you know, there's any one true answer um, to anything. Um, and, I th and, you know, I think it's all about experimentation. It's all about development. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, here I am. I've been ranting. I've been sort of digressing a bit. So back to the actual jam, how can it actually help? So what I'm going to do now is just go over a couple of jam hacks for, um, that I found quite useful. Um, and I'll try and kind of give a bit of context as to how I, came, uh, how I discovered them and why I find them quite useful. Um, and yeah, and actually at this point will be really great to hear kind of any of your ideas or suggestions actually, because I'm very much aware of the fact that Oh, so many of these conferences I've been to, you know, people again, much like myself, come up, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, with um, a supposed solution. And you can already sort of think, well, mm, well, actually, if, you know, so I've got like X number of engineers and they all need to be part of this project, but, you know, we haven't actually scheduled it because we didn't know sort of like a year in advance and we need to do this project, blah, 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 how would this work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, you know, at this point, do you feel free at any point, just raise your hand or just make a comment. Um, or, I mean, don't hack or don't be mean, because you don't want to make me cry or anything, right? But yeah, feel free to kind of keep the conversation going. So yeah, four jam hacks, what I found useful. <clears throat> so this is a bit where the whole thing about validating and testing design actually um, comes into it. So firstly, jam culture. Um, this guy here is a lovely Chris Sadler. Um, he's on Twitter as at Chris Sadler, um, and he's amazing. He's a, he's a really lovely kind of um, <coughs> systems thinker and service designer. Um, what he's doing here is he's writing on um, a piece of brown paper. You can tell it's like a design event because <laughs> everything was done on this brown paper. Like, I don't know, it's like avocados, you know what I mean? Like, that's how you know that you're at a design event. Everything's written on brown paper and there's avocados, like. <laughs> Hips and UX people, like literally. <laughs> it's got to be said. Well, at least I'll say it first before any of the developers say it. <laughs> you know. But anyway, so yeah, so that's Chris writing up, writing the the, um, the jam the jam culture. So, what actually is the jam culture? So, again, I'll give I'll give some context. When you first start off the um, the design jam, um, you start off with some introductory kind of um, little activities, the things you know, so you all get to know each other. Um, actually, not particularly cringy. I guess, again, I guess it's that thing, we're all hipsters, so we all cringe fairly easily. So, I don't know, any activities we do organise for each other tends to be fairly cool and ironic. Um, so we've got that down in the bag. And after this, we, um, we come together, we start doing this actually quite a fun little event, a little thing, where you try to create like the tallest um, structure out of dried spaghetti that will hold a marshmallow on the top, right? And I'm sure there's plenty of people who've done, kind of done this sort of thing before. Um, <coughs> And the whole point of that is that you get to learn how to work as part of a team um, with these strangers, because most of them will be strangers, unless of course you've done the uncool thing and just brought like a bunch of your friends from like St. Martin's College, but that's not cool, you shouldn't do that, that's just unfair. But anyway, most of the people you'll be working with will be complete strangers. Um, and so yeah, you, you get to learn how to work within a very short amount of time to create, um, to, to kind of overcome this particular challenge. <coughs> And as a result of that, um, we kind of all gather around in a circle, well, more of a potato, because it's ironic, um, and someone like Chris will write on the brown paper all the things that we've learned. Um, and that's kind of some of the things that he's writing um, there right now. And that becomes the jam culture. So it's a piece of paper that's always there, always in plain view of everyone. And actually, every anyone and everyone is free to write on it. And the idea is that you're basically writing down all the things that you've learned from, say, that particular day or maybe that particular design session. Um, and, that, and that, again, becomes a culture. It becomes something that any time you're stuck, any time you're in the middle of an argument, any time you're just fed up or you're just really, really hungry, as often happened to me, you know, you turn around to it, you look up to it, and you remember why you were there. So, yeah. That was the first hack that I learned and that I actually found genuinely quite useful. Make a jam culture. 
The thing with the jam culture, though, is that it's based on experience. It's not based on, say, what a genius, however much of a genius they may be, says um, is the best way to design. It's based on what you have experienced. <clears throat> It's where you can document your learnings. It's where you can document all the things that you've come across, all the things that you've learned both about yourself and about others. <coughs> and it's also a good reason to, um, to, have, to also think about your wider approach to the work that you do. So as I said, for me, um, kind of I've, I've worked now in a couple of different, fi different fields or different um, sort of um, sectors. And every time I start, you know, it's very easy for me, again, as the slightly idealistic um, theorist UX designer to think, oh, well, there's all these things that they haven't got done quite right. They really need to rethink this way. They need to think, you know, change up their structure. Um, and it can be very easy, actually, at some point to become quite overwhelmed by the amount of work that you need to do. Um, but actually, I found a really good piece of advice. So I can't even say that I can't even take credit for this. Um, this was actually, again, a generally good piece of advice. That I think it's probably from, again, from one of Jared Spool's talks, actually. Um, and they were saying, well, if you find yourself in, in that experience, actually take a step back and almost see yourself as, as a scientist, almost as, as an anthropologist observing not just your environment, but yourself. Take everything as a case study. And that level of objectivity is, A, very, very useful. And it also means that you'll be able to write lots of really cool articles for Medium. So I don't know. It's like a, <laughs> lots of wins, basically. So yeah, take everything as a case study. And, going, and when you're sort of documenting this, when going back to the jam culture, make sure, um, so this again is trying to think of it more out for those of us who are working, um, perhaps more in user experience design or any other kind of um, design, make sure it's accessible for everyone to join in. So that's very important. Make sure it, it doesn't seem like, oh, this is just that thing that Florence does. Like she just wanders around, throws salt over her left shoulder and then just writes like, I don't know, Ch open up your mind on the brown paper next to the avocados. We don't know why she does this, but yeah. So yeah, make sure that it's obvious that like it's for everyone to join in and to and to document the things that they have learned, not not really so much the things that they might have read about in a book about design. <clears throat> Be prepared for change. Culture evolves. Um, so yeah, the whole idea of the design culture um, sheet is not that it stays static. Um, you can cross things out if you find after a couple of days that actually, you know what, that's no longer the case. I was in a really bad mood, or I was in a really good mood when I wrote that, and I wasn't, I wasn't being fully objective. So yeah, be, so the point is that this is, it's very much a living document. It doesn't even have to be a document necessarily. It could be in any format, although, as I said, brown paper is cool. Um, <clears throat> But the point is, as long as it's, it's visible, it's a place where you can document what you've, what you've learned, what you've actually experienced. Um, and that can be incredibly helpful. Adopt the maker's ethos. Now, to be fair, I mean, I'm talking to people who are mostly developers, so I'm sure this probably doesn't come as any surprise. Um, and if you're, any, if you're someone like me, who kind of basically, there was a point in my life when like every weekend I was at a hackathon. So, <clears throat> this wasn't particularly a difficult thing for me to, or at least I thought initially this would not be a particularly difficult thing for me to master. But actually, there was something about um, doing the jam process that actually kind of shook me up in a way. So this is an example um, of one of our of the most recent um, design jam that I was part of, and it's called like the Global Service Jam. And the goal, the idea is that you have 48 hours. It's kind of an obsession, 48 hours to change the world. In this case, 48 hours to try to redesign some aspect of the local services around you. Um, and believe it or not, that piece of Lego is meant to represent a fountain. Um, the cardboard is meant to represent, I don't know, the internal crisis of the 21st century woman. I don't quite, I don't know. But um, <laughs> the point is it's a prototype. Um, and it's meant to somehow encapsulate all the things that we were discussing and arguing and ranting about. Um, and we created like a, a little poster again, just to kind of uplift our eyes, as it were, to raise our spirits. So yeah, fundamentally, oh yeah, that was actually, should have stayed there for a bit longer, but anyway, that's an example of, of the prototype point, point two, as it were. But fundamentally, our, what the next kind of hack that I found really helpful was simply don't talk, make. Literally, don't talk, just make stuff. Keep making stuff. Prototype, 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 always. 
if you can't explain it, if you're having difficulty talking about it with your colleagues or with your teammates or with anyone or even with yourself, again, if you're a theorist, then we talk to ourselves a lot of the time. To be fair, it's because we're like the only ones who actually understand what we're going through. But anyway, um, make it. Make it for yourself. Make it for others. <clears throat> And if you can explain it, then you should definitely be able to make it. Just keep making it. Keep your hands busy. I'm someone who really does, well, I wouldn't say believe, but I really do think that um, we kind of exaggerate our cerebral natures and we forget that we are sort of holistic beings in a sense. Now, that sounds really hippie-ish, but I, I'm a physicist. I'm not a hippie. Um, what I mean is that, you know, we touch, we feel, we eat, we, we, we taste, we, we smell. Um, that's how we understand um, our environment, and that's often how we understand our solutions. Uh, one of the things I always like to say to people who kind of think of design as, as solely making something look nice is that often our emotional reactions are actually kind of like shorthand for um, our, our logical reactions. They're not actually in opposition with each other necessarily. They're often complementing each other. When I look at a well-designed chair and I think it's beautiful, well, let's remember that my brain and my processes were ultimately formed by evolution. So when I'm looking at it, it's probably not so much just because I'm appreciating like the curvature. I'm appreciating it because ultimately I'm a homo sapiens. It's like, oh, I know what that is. That's not a lion. It's not a saber-toothed tiger. It's not another ape. It's a, it's a thing that I know what to do with. And I know what this is. And I know what to do with that. I know where this is placed. And I understand what this is for. I often think that's one of, those, one of the reasons we tend to call really weird things beautiful. Like, you know, when we talk about war, or we talk about death, or sometimes we call these really odd things beautiful. And I suspect that's actually a shorthand for us saying, oh, no, I get it. I, I get what, where that fits, you know? Um, and, that's, and that, again, is where the power prototyping comes in. It really shows, it's a way of showing that you kind of understand where this thing fits and what it's meant to do. And if you didn't understand it, well, then it's a way of ensuring that you do kind of understand it with all of your senses, you know? Or at least, uh, it makes sense to me, but, well, whatever. One other thing that I found really helpful from this, um, from doing, uh, from working like this, you know, very rapidly prototyping, and I mean, really rapidly prototyping actually, and I think this is probably why it was still a bit of a shock to the system, even for someone who does a lot of hackathons, was because actually you weren't really expected to even necessarily make anything that worked. You're almost just expected to just make something. You have an idea, just try to somehow um, depict it in physical form, you know? So it could literally just be a, a piece of paper that you kind of, you know, wave around in the breeze to represent, I don't know, again, internal crises. I don't know. But the point is, um, it was really just a way of expressing kind of your questions. Um, and the thing that I found very helpful, actually, was that if I actually documented um, the, the, the design decisions that we made, um, that was very helpful later on when it came to generating test cases, for example. So this, this, this was especially good if, if for the more technical projects, but even for the things that were more about service design and process design. Um, you know, it's, it's, I always, again, perhaps owing to, owing to um, my background, um, having studied physics, I do like the idea that everything should be ultimately testable. Um, and yeah, actually, um, there's, nothing, there's nothing that kind of encourages that sense of confidence um, about your design when, you've, when you realize that you can, you can test it, you know, you can kind of quantify whether it works and how it works, um, rather than simply being just saying, well, and it looks nice, you know? So yeah, document the design decision flow if possible. The branches will help generate test cases. Test in anger. I really like saying in anger. Like I encountered that phrase for the first time working in IT, and it was just so funny because you just listen to all these like middle-aged men in like suits say, "Yeah, and now we will test it in anger," and you're just like, "That's <laughs> okay." Is that Okay, fine, okay, okay, fine, w whatever that means. I, I always got this like, idea, which is a bunch of engineers going around, like, destroying, like, the national grid system of, like, the UK, you know? Like, we're going to test this app in anger, like, chuck all their iPhones against, like, the gas mains. I don't, I don't understand it. Um, but, yeah, I still don't really understand it, to be honest. Um, but it just sounds really cool, test in anger. It sounds like something that Evanescence would sing, you know what I mean? <laughs> Sorry. Evanescent. I don't actually know. I think no. We're all roughly of, of of an age, aren't we? We are equals here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. We, you you all knew who, who Evanescent were. Don't pretend. Um, yeah. So this kind of segues nicely. Um, for, who would have thought? Um, from my earlier point, actually. Um, Whenever you, made, whenever you made a prototype, the idea of it wasn't just to, to say, ha, we've, we've overcome this goal, we've made a thing because we were told to make it. 
The point was that you would then go out and test it. <coughs> so test often and test hard, even if it is just a scrap of paper. And I'll give you an example. So the very first design jam I took part in was the sustainability jam, right? Um, and for some reason, our team decided to choose like the hardest problem of, of all, um, which we didn't realize until you know, we actually started documenting it. Because we realized it wasn't a problem that could be solved with an app or with a website. It was really about changing how ordinary people saw themselves like did they see themselves as agents of injustice or oppression or environmental or environmental destruction like or did they see themselves as agents of of the opposite of all those things you know um, and that was and the thing about how we could change that that was actually turned out to be a really difficult problem um, and somehow we were able to actually test a prototype of that <laughs> we were able to test out um, uh, a service, you know, um, a user journey um, with, with ordinary people in the streets of Birmingham. Um, and from that, I certainly learned the, the benefits of sort of testing often and testing hard, um, almost forcing yourself out there no matter how weird it is, you know. So obviously for those, obviously most of you are developers, uh, certainly my background as well. So yeah, it's kind of a given to test with users. So one of the things that I found really pre quite fun about the jam was that they'd almost spice it up a bit. So A, you'd obviously you'd test in the jam you'd be testing with people who you had no idea you know who they were and they had no idea who you were but also like the timing of it was quite odd so like you'd have like 10 minutes to chat and think about um, a problem and then they'd be like oh how you know okay now you're going out to test that and they'll be like well we haven't even made a pro like, it doesn't matter go out and test it um, and often and almost that disruption actually did help with the creative pro with our um, creative process now in reality you know you might want to you know change the gauge on that but I do think that's something that can be quite helpful almost like getting a die or something that you just roll and like every every time you roll it you see if it's like an odd number it's the time to go and test whether you've actually really got like a work a working prototype or anything just go forth and test show it to someone else talk about it with someone else um, it did help and it certainly helped me uh, working as kind of a, a working as, uh, as the in-house UX designer Testing with non-users, we also found was really helpful as well. Okay, fine, they didn't really understand the use case. Yes, fine, the product wasn't something they would particularly use, but it did wonders for your storytelling skills, actually, because then you had to really <coughs> get them on board to understand who this user, who this persona was. Um, so that was something, again, that I, I found quite helpful. And again, especially being the theorist, you know, you kind of want to go out and talk, talk, to, talk with people and find new ways of communicating with people. Um, and yeah, it was a... It was a <laughs> definitely tough learning it, but by the end of the two days, you kind of, yeah, you, you, you kind of take it in your stride, as it were. The next thing, obviously, um, once you've tested, um, especially when you've tested with people who aren't necessarily your target audience, um, you can actually, again, use that journey to sort of spur further test cases with users, with people who are sort of the personas, as it were. Um, so yeah, it's always, again, it's all about, for me, it's always about trying to find ways of validating a design um, with, a minimal, with a minimal effort and trying to do it as informal as possible. And these are all things that kind of help you um, find new ways of testing and validating your designs. Um, and yeah, finally, to use tests to settle those on yeah, I really need a thesaurus, but what can you do? But yeah, often when you'd be working in a group with people who you didn't necessarily know, and you'd be arguing, discussing all of these problems, um, and there was often no particular answer that was better than the other, we learned is eventually that we didn't even have to be told to go out and test the prototype. We just did it because, well, to be honest, it was better than sitting in a really hot room arguing with someone who you don't know. But it did also help us kind of realize what the, the solutions or what was closest to the solution and what that would be. So yeah, that's something that I found quite helpful. Finally, humility breeds testability. I, oh, I was so proud of myself when I came up with that, and now I'm reading that, and it sounds so dorky. But anyway, it's the truth. I found, anyway, that being humble about your ideas, um, always going for the yes and, um, treating everyone's ideas as precious resources, never trying to be particularly dismissive, but always making sure that you're building up ideas, even if it's completely left field and out there, and you don't really understand where they're coming from. Just force yourself to say yes, and and it's amazing the things that you can come up with at the end of it. Um, and again, as someone you know, like I said, as someone who you know 
to be honest, has a bit of a temper. Um, I found really helpful when I was, especially in business meetings, because it, it just changed my whole perspective. Instead of going into a meeting thinking, OK, I've got to convince these people to do this thing, I have to really talk to them in a language they understand, and they have to take me seriously, but they won't because I'm young and I'm female and blah, 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 blah. So I'm really kind of Actually, just going at it, I thought, though, no, their ideas are equally as precious as mine and equally as valuable as mine, um, kind of really changed the tone of the conversation. There was this wonderful comedian, and I've completely forgotten his name. I was just listening to a TED talk with him um, a couple of months, like, you know, a couple of months ago. And at the end of it, like the interview was like, you know, oh, you know, someone of your stature who's done all these amazing things, and you know, you know, what is there left for you to accomplish? Or you know, someone like me who hasn't really achieved much in my life, I often feel quite, you know, in awe of people like you. Um, and the comedian was like, well, <laughs> to be fair, if you take science seriously, we're living in a universe, multiverse, filled with billions of galaxies, each one with billions of stars, each one with billions of planets, um, and probably a lot of them with some form of life on it. So like the gap between, the, the perceived gap between yourself and me is infinitesimally small on the scale of the universe. So really, it doesn't matter actually. And actually, and that kind of humility is really helpful because it makes you realize, yeah, actually fine, I might have certain skills that I might consider someone else not to have, but the gap between those skills, those skill levels is, well, worthless to be honest. It's not something to start to use to justify why I should dismiss someone else's ideas or indeed why I should dismiss my own ideas, you know? So yeah, boil them all up. Things are saying, now this is a bit left field, I have to be honest, like this came to me like in almost like a vision, so it might not make complete sense, um, but it kind of does. So again, drawing on this idea of humility, you're not going to come up with all the answers. That's, a, that's the truth of it. Um, and thinking sustainably, I think what, what I'm trying to get across is the, this idea of thinking of yourself as like a link in an ongoing chain. You're not going to be, nobody actually is um, the person who kind of finishes, it, finishes the chain or completely solves everything. Um, now, of course, that is very much my bias. Um, I'm someone who, who's very much against sort of the great, the great person um, interpretation of history. Um, for example, if you want to get into more discussions about history of science and technology and interpretations of history, you know where I am. Um, and this, I suppose this is, that this is my bias. But you know, I think it's also it's really important to, uh, to understand the fact that, yeah, we, nobody ever is ever going to come up with all the answers. And also that problems evolve. And what's really interesting, especially from a social justice perspective, is how often the problems we face have evolved actually from solutions of the past. I don't know if anyone's noticed that when you like, look into history or economics. So yeah, I think if you're thinking that almost sustainably, thinking of yourself as one generation of many, that can really, again, change the way that we go into these design conversations. I know, I know, it sounds so pretentious. I like, think of all like, the scale of the multiverse when it comes to like, just going into meet a client for like some, I don't know, real-time app or something. But it helps. Well, it helps me anyway. Leave space for the designers of tomorrow, who may well include you. So that's, that's kind of where that's all, all going, going towards. So finally, uh, and I know a bit over time, but uh, in conclusion, <clears throat> and there is kind of a conclusion. So one, things that can help you um, create uh, testable designs, things can help you validate your design. So one, create a jam culture based on lived experience. Um, this is often something that you can use to um, use as a kind of um, uh, evaluate a framework for evaluating your designs and evaluating your process, um, a heuristic, if you will. Um, if you're going to create these uh, jam cultures, which I really would suggest you do because they're quite helpful, um, or don't. I know, I'm not the boss of you, you can do what you want. But if you are going to do it, make it big and clear to everyone. Make it, you know, open access. Make sure that everyone knows that they can be a part of creating this culture. Treat everything you do as a case study, you know. I'm really into DIY bio, for example, and actually when I realized, when I first, when I was reading this kind of bit of advice, I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, this really is kind of like DIY anthropology in a sense. It's DIY behavioral um, psychology, you know? I'm really learning to analyze myself and my reactions and how, say, this particular mood affects the way I talk to my clients or I talk to my, uh, um, my teammates, for example. Um, and it can be a bit cringy, um, but it's helpful. And as I said, at the very least, you might be able to get a book out of it. Who knows? <laughs> Two, prototype, prototype, prototype. 
I love that. Oh my God, it's so cool. Um, keep making, always make. Talk, actually, yeah, I know before I was like, oh, don't talk, just make. And to be honest, that's so authoritarian. Like, that's just uncool. It doesn't really matter. Talk, don't talk, but just be sure to make. Make sure that you're, that, you're, that you're physically embodying what it is that you're doing, whether it's through code or literally through scraps of paper. Who cares? Just make it. Make sure that there's something that people can interact with and think about. Document your design path. Again, it, it can be really difficult when everyone's kind of just properly jamming, really getting into the flow, really coming up with all these really cool ide uh, design ideas. But at the scribe, it's again a bit of a discipline. But again, that's really helpful. It will provide the test cases of the future. And you'll be grateful for it, because it means that you'll be able to say, yeah, this is how we now know that this particular design decision that we took was actually worth it, because we can compare it to this other design decision that we were also think of taking, blah, 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 blah. It all works out. <coughs> Three. Test with anyone and everyone. <clears throat> Test to get rid of design block. This is something that I found um, really helpful as well. It's kind of like a summation of all the things that I was sort of talking about, about testing. Um, I'm someone who does suffer very frequently from design block, probably because, well, I would say it's because my background is not technically in design as such. But having spoken to other people who are proper, who are proper designers, like graphic designers and people like that, they also suffer from design block on pretty much the same frequency as me. So maybe not. But anyway, one thing we do tend to agree with is that actually just showing what we've made to someone else and getting them to like try to use it or interact with it can kind of actually help us get out of that creative block. So that's pretty cool, I think. Four. Remember, you don't have all the answers. Remember, you probably will never have all the answers. I say probably. Like I said, I studied physics, and I know you should never really talk, talk in certainties in this age of quantum physics. So, but yeah, you probably ne will never have all the answers. Always think yes and. Build up ideas. Don't discard. They are precious bits of energy, um, for that they might seem totally and utterly random. Um, so yeah, those are the four points. And uh, oh my gosh. Number five, do a jam. Really, I can't tell you how great these things are. Actually do one, find out for yourself how great they are. They're really interesting. I think they're slightly different. As I said, they're slightly different from hackathons because of the fact that like with hackathon, you're always kind of thinking, no, we'll be able to sort of make something by the end of it. With a design jam, actually the proof of it is kind of in the eating rather than in the pudding. It's in the process, is what I'm trying to say, rather than what you make at the end of it. I know, I know. I'm going to blame the hamburgers. Those are really good and are impeding my ability to come up with really like cool catchphrases. But anyway, yeah, good food, Ugh, honestly. Um, but yeah, seriously, go forth, do a jam. There's one coming up in November. Oh yeah, and at this point, I really should make a disclaimer. Um, you will find my face on like the Birmingham Spaghetti Jam website, um, and they're the people who run like the uh, jams in Birmingham. Um, and uh, I wouldn't see myself as a shill for them. Um, this is really just about all the things that I learned before I started kind of joining the team and trying to kind of spread the word of the jam elsewhere. Um, but yeah, check it out. Um, you know, have a go. Bit weird at first, bit uncomfortable, but it's really cool. There's always lots of rubber chickens, and I don't know, you might get to do a funny little dance. So with that, thank you very much for listening. Nobody said anything too bad, so I'm hoping that was either because you were asleep, which is kind of good because like sleep is good. So I'm glad <laughs> if that's what it was, or you're also engrossed in what I was saying, in which case I'm slightly worried because like that was no nonsense. You are aware of that, right? No, really. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for having me. And yeah.